Hello and welcome everybody. Good morning. I want to welcome everybody to the uh, overview of the SEMA, the Certified Investment Management Analyst Certification. I just want to give it a few seconds here as we wait for our uh, everybody, all our attendees to uh, read, uh, log in. Great, and as uh, everybody's uh, beginning to uh, log in here and attend the webinar, um, please um, uh, type in, we have a, the chat box open for anybody who would like to reach out and let us know where you're uh, calling in from. It's always very helpful. So let's get started here. It looks like everybody's starting to, uh, to register and log in here. Um, just wanted to reach out. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Gray Bullard. Uh, I am an enrollment counselor here with my colleague, Carrie Estes. We uh, can help answer any questions that you have at the end of the webinar here. Uh, today's webinar, all lines are muted. Uh, please type your questions in our chat uh, box there to, um, to facilitate interaction throughout the uh, webinar here as we go through the Certified Investment Management Analyst Program. Uh, this me, webinar is okay, okay. The chat is not working for the participants. Oh, let's get the chat working here. It's only the four of us. Okay, as we move along here, we'll get the chat working. Um, again, I wanted to just reach out to everybody, let everybody know that uh, uh, who we are, the Investments and Wealth Institute here. Uh, let's get the chat working here so we can get everybody logged in. Yep, I'm working on that. You can go ahead and, and continue. Great. So as the Investments and Wealth Institute, our mission here is to deliver career investment consulting, wealth management and retirement credentials and world-class education. We host webinars, uh, our, our three certifications here, the Certified Investment Management Analyst Program and our conferences. So this is a little bit of a snapshot here in our ecosystem. We manage three conferences throughout the year. Uh, the um, Our next conference coming up is in New York City, the Investments and Wealth Forum in November. We also have our uh, main annual conference uh, in Las Vegas next year in April. So this is a great opportunity for you to network with other advisors, uh, as well as getting continuing education credit throughout the year for your designations. We also have three certifications, as I mentioned here, the Certified Investment Management Analyst Program, uh, the Certified Private Wealth Advisor, as well as the RMA, which is the Retirement Management Advisor Certification. So just in case uh, you have any other questions, we host these webinars, <coughs> excuse me, throughout the uh, day today. And I just wanted to get into a little bit of the program over here for the Certified Investment Management Analyst Program. This is the, the uh, core curriculum. It focuses on five pillars, uh, fundamentals, statistics, uh, methods, applied finance, uh, global capital markets, as well as investments, uh, equity, fixed income, alternative investments, as well as real estate, um, portfolio theory and behavioral finance. <coughs> Excuse me here, a little dry here in Denver. The uh, portfolio theory and behavioral finance. Uh, covers investment philosophy, styles, uh, tools, and strategies, as well as risk and return, uh, attributes of risk. <laughs> Excuse me. Oh, great. We have our chat going here. Um, we have folks logging in from Nashville, New York. Uh, wonderful. Um, and finally, our portfolio construction and consulting process. This culminates the entire uh, Certified Investment Management Analyst Program and encapsulates everything uh, and... Uh, that's uh, some snapshots here of our detailed content outline as well. Um, then we can move on to the next slide here. And uh, today I wanna to talk a little bit about our SEMA educational providers, uh, the Yale School of Management and Chicago Booth. Yale is 100% uh, online. It's a self-paced course, which gives you ultimate flexibility as well as Chicago Booth, uh, which is our hybrid program. Uh, uh, Kathleen Fitzgerald is going to talk a little bit about her program today. Uh, the program is um, a three and a half month long course, focuses on um, uh, giving you a little flexibility, but you'll be meeting with faculty every week. So every Wednesday evening, 
uh, Chicago time from 7 to 8.30. You'll be able to ask questions and uh, talk with the staff there at University of Chicago. But we also wanted to uh, mention that our start date, the first class, is January 3rd. So please, uh, um, you know, uh, please register before that so we can get you into that next class, which starts on January 3rd. And without further ado, I wanted to uh, introduce our um, uh, Kathleen Fitzgerald, which is um, our clinical associate professor of strategic management. And uh, she can go in, uh, into more detail on the curriculum. And she's going to talk a little bit about risk management today. Um, so I'm um, looking forward to uh, hearing a little bit more about uh, what Kathleen's going to present today. Hi. Well, it's not going to be risk management. Um, that is not today's topic. Oh, okay. Well, what are you presenting today? <laughs> <laughs> risk measures. Yeah. So welcome everyone. Um, sorry, I'm wearing a sweatshirt, but at least it says Chicago. <laughs> yeah. I haven't figured out. I moved into a new apartment. I can't figure out how to work the heat. So, um, so that's where I'm at. So um, I'm Kathleen. Uh, welcome. I'm glad to see you from all over the place. Got some people from India and Tokyo as well. Um, SEMA is becoming more and more international as a as a certificate. So I did see. I'm going to just answer this as we go. Um, it, it The question from AA about whether this is a globally recognized certificate, certificate, I'm going to let Gray and Carrie answer that. But I know that that's something that they're working on. And yes, it's very confusing that it's also SEMA is the certified investment. What is it? Management accounting? as well ours is better yeah i can say that because i am an accountant <laughs> so i'm going to talk a little bit about the curriculum a little more detail we're going to talk about measuring risk then rebecca and monica are going to talk about the chicago booth program and then carrie and gray will put it all together for us so gray briefly talked about some of the or at least mentioned the curriculum i want to talk a little bit more about it so let me share my screen There we go, you can all see the screen, right? With the detailed curriculum. I only need one person to say yes. Carrie says yes. Okay, so how does the program work? Um, we start with the foundation. So the foundations are things that we're gonna use all throughout the rest of the curriculum. Um, so we will start with statistics, probability, time value of money, microeconomics, macroeconomics, and capital markets history. So when we talk about statistics, we're gonna do things like mean, I'm having a, I am also having issues today, yeah. Let me just, uh, Okay. There we go. Mean, median, mode, variance, standard deviation, correlation, covariance, because these are kind of the fundamentals of the asset pricing models and portfolio theory and risk and return. So many, many things are needed on it. And of course, because statistics describe the past, we also, when we build portfolios and do things, it's about the future. So we will also think about expected returns and expected variance and standard deviation, et cetera. So do probability. Time value of money, we use time value of money for pricing, right? Pricing and for planning. So we go forward with time, with money. We're thinking about, um, <laughs> Um, our retirement, for example. We bring money backwards, we're trying to price something. Microeconomics is the core of so many, many things. So we'll do some basic supply and demand, um, elasticity, uh, 
etc. Macroeconomics, you cannot operate if you don't understand the business environment. Um, so we're going to talk about the business cycle, inflation, um, indicators of the business cycle, lots of things on micro, macro, and then you should know at least some basics of what happened in the past, right? So that's capital markets history. So these are our foundations. So once we have the tools, then we start thinking about, well, what can we invest in? And then we want to think about all of the characteristics of the different types of investments. So whether it's equity, fixed income, alternatives, including option futures and other derivatives and real assets. So we're going to think about their return patterns, their risk patterns, um, their structure in the sense of taxation, um, correlation between the different types of asset classes. And then we'll talk also about, you could instead of buying them directly, buy things like, or use things such as SMAs, hedge funds, mutual funds, REITs, and many, many more. So we have our foundations, then we've got our investments. And then we really think about how we're gonna put those investments together in a portfolio. And that, that's when we're gonna think, learn about modern portfolio theory, postmodern portfolio theory, where we only think about downside uh, risk, uh, asset pricing models, the capital asset pricing model and multi-factor models. We think about the environment, efficient market hypothesis, behavioral finance, technical analysis, and then we'll think in general about what are different investment philosophies and styles that we would have that would guide your putting together these portfolios. So we have our tools, we know what we can invest in, we put them together in a portfolio. Now we wanna measure components of our portfolio. So we're gonna look at all different types of risk and risk measures. We'll talk about risk measures today. We'll talk about return measures, uh, return measures being, for example, arithmetic returns, internal rates of return, also called time-weighted. I mean, uh, not called time-weighted, called dollar-weighted. That's our IRR time-weighted, also called geometric. We'll look at holding periods, returns, capital gains, income yields. I mean, all different types of measures of returns that we could have. We might even include something like um, multiple invested capital or public market equivalent if we start thinking about private equity. On the performance measurement side, let's see how our portfolio did, right? So our portfolio could be like, um, what are some performance measures you use? What do you look at? Oh, hmm. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know that we would look at return on equity. Um, maybe if we were doing fundamental analysis, but we would look at more things like Sharp, Trainer, Alpha, Information Ratio, um, M squared, R squared. We, we would consider beta and correlation, but not as a performance measurement. Um, but we would definitely use the beta over here, right? We would also use correlation here in portfolio theory. So lots of different measures. Uh, Jensen's alpha is regular as an addition. 
So lots of different performance measurements and we'll think about them and we'll think about the periods over which we do them. And then finally attribution says, you either performed or you didn't overperform. Uh, why? So is it because of asset allocation? Or was it because of security selection, right? So attribution really tells us why. I beat my benchmark by 5%, why? I had my assets in the right asset class at the right time or within asset classes, I picked better securities. Those are our options. Um, and then finally, so that's kind of like the hardcore investment stuff. And then we need to put it all together in your role, which is why you're doing the certification in the first place. So we'll talk about um, IWI's code of professional responsibility and disciplinary rules. We'll talk about how do you learn about your client? What do you put into an investment policy statement? in terms of client, investments, governance, right? How are you gonna put those portfolios together? What you're gonna be your, are you gonna use a strategic portfolio? Is it gonna be dynamic? Is it gonna be tactical? Is it gonna be buy and hold, right? What is my target um, allocation? all different things about the important things about putting a portfolio together. And obviously one of the major things is picking the right um, investments and choosing the right managers. So manager search and selection. We'll do a lot on manager search and selection. What's important? What do you look for? How do you do your due diligence, right? Fees multi-manager versus single manager. And then at the end of that whole process, how we do our portfolio review and our revisions. So things like rebalancing, for example. So I would say it's a very comprehensive certificate body of knowledge um, and not really anything wasted. So some exams, you know, you study for months and months and. You're just never going to use a lot of it. So all of this stuff you'll use. The, the certificate is designed for use, okay? And it's specifically for you guys, um, ladies and guys um, out there. Does this make sense to you? What do you think about this curriculum? Is this what you're kind of looking for? Yeah, it's very, very, very comprehensive. And we go through it step by step. Yeah. So let's uh, talk about risk. So I want to talk, this is kind of like an outline of what we're going to do. But what is risk? Can you write in the chat what risk is? If your client said to you, what's risk? What would you say? Variability. Good one. Uncertainty. Potential for loss. You don't really give up risk to get a return. You, what do you mean? You, um, you take on risk to get returns, right? In fact, the higher the risk, if I had risk here and expected return here, it goes in this direction, right? Yeah. It's really kind of like deviations from the average return. Right? Could be unknown and known, yep. Unknown, it's kind of hard to model that, yeah. 
Yeah, all different types of risk. So I'm going to say that it's kind of like deviation from the average return, and we can look at it. So for this example here, um, you can see we're thinking about the spread of returns, right? Here's the average, but we could have earned that much, or we could have lost all of that money. And you can see that the spread is different for different as asset classes. What's at the bottom? Merging markets are very risky, right? But down the bottom, look at this. It's just cash, right? Could be a money market. Oh, those are T-bills actually. Those don't move very much at all, right? So this is kind of return variation within asset classes. So when we do statistics, I'm not gonna read all these things. I'm just making a list because we'll provide you with these slides. Um, standard deviation is the most common measure, right? So it's a measure of dispersion. Um, variance is also a measure of dispersion. Standard deviation is the square root of the variance. Systematic risk, you guys have talked about, it's called beta risk. So this is risk we can't diversify. It doesn't matter how many assets we have in our portfolio, we can't get rid of this risk. So this is market risk, recessions, inflation, exchange rates, interest rates. Um, these are all forms of systematic risk. Idiosyncratic risk, though, is diversifiable. And this is non-systematic. Um, and this is something that we can diversify. So in the end, we'll find we don't get paid to take on systematic um, idiosyncratic risk. You need to pay me to take away risk I can't diversify, right? I need to be paid for that. Uh, covariance is a measure of how returns, for example, move together. It doesn't have to be returns. It could be uh, sales and weather, right? Things like that. But we think about returns. So it tells me about the direction. And correlation, covariance is positive or it is negative. It's positive when the returns on two assets, for example, um, tend to be above or below their respective means at the same time. So when A is above its mean, B is above its mean. When A is below its mean, B is below its mean. That's positive covariance. Negative covariance would be more like when A is doing well, B is doing poorly. When B is doing well, A is doing poorly. So it tells us about the direction. Correlation, closely related. Correlation is about the strength. So it's the strength of that uh, covariance. So it's covariance divided by the product of the standard deviations. And, and correlation goes between minus one and one. And this is very important for forming portfolios. This is this is diversification, right? That's where, that's where we're getting this. Um, then we've got some other statistical measures of risk, tail risk. Um, that's the risk of the investment moving more than three standard deviations from the current price. So if I were to have, like the current price here, one, two, three, it would be the price being here in the tails of the distribution. Downside risk is the risk of losing value. There's lots of different ones that we use. Uh, shortfall risk, semi-variance, target semi-variance, downside deviation. And that's what these four are here. So this is for individuals that are concerned with returns below a certain amount. 
So in class, we'll learn about both. We'll learn about you know, both sides of the distribution and one side of the distribution. By the way, when it's one side, what do we call that? Sortino. Sortino is a performance measure. So let's take a deeper dive into the statistic. So the mean or the average is just that you add everything up and you divide by the number of observations. The median is the middle number and the mode is the most frequent. I have to do this because I can't show you standard deviation without showing you mean. Variance is the average squared distance of observations from the mean. So it's also standard deviation squared. It cannot be negative. And then standard deviation is the square root of the variance. So it's best to do it with an example. Let's say I've got stock A, and you can help me. For stock A, we earn minus one, five, five, 11, and five from January to May. What is my median return? It's five. And when you do the median, it's minus one, five, 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 eleven. You need to rank them. Minus six, minus three, minus one, zero, and five. What is the median for stock B? The median, minus one. Right, it's here. You have to rank them and you pick the middle. What is the mode for stock A? Great, 5%. What's the mode for stock B? Do we have one? We don't have one. We would say not applicable, not applicable. What about the mean? So for A, it's minus one plus five plus five plus 11 plus five divided by five. Is the mean also 5%? I think it is. And then for stock B, it's five minus six plus zero, minus three, minus one, divided by five, what's that, 1%? Is everyone agree? Oh, minus 1%. Thank you. Perfect. Thanks, Derek. Minus 1%. So once we have the mean, we could easily calculate the standard deviation. So that, the, well, the, we'll do the variance first. So the variance is minus 1 minus the mean square, 5 minus the mean square, 5 minus the mean square, 11 minus the mean squared and five minus the mean squared, all divided by five. So that is 36 plus zero plus zero plus 36 plus zero divided by five. And if I were to do that, it's 12 point something, right? What is it, 12.4? What's five times 12, 60, no more. 14.4? 14.4, 14 
Usually I have my little, ah, I do have a calculator, hold on. I do have a calculator, 14 points. And then the standard deviation Three point seven nine percent. If I did the same thing for B, I already have the answer. The standard deviation is three point six three percent. Does it make sense to you that the standard deviation is a little bit larger for A? It should, right? Because the spread is wider. It's from minus one to 11. The other one's from minus one to five. So it's just a little bit more of a spread. Okay, so we would calculate the mean and the standard deviation, but how do we use that? Well, the empirical rule says, if this is the mean, and that's one standard deviation, and that's two, then 68% of the data falls within one standard deviation, 95% falls within two, and we've got 2.5% in the tails. So 13.5, 34, 34, 13.5. So what's the probability then that the return is greater than for stock A? Let's say for stock A, we had um, a mean of 5%. What's the probability then we would say of it being greater than five? This is symmetric, so 50% is above the mean and 50% is below. Where it was, if it weren't symmetric, then we would talk about things like skewness. And we'll talk about how stock returns can be skewed left or skewed right. And we'll talk about things like kurtosis, where there are more extreme observations than predicted by what we, we would say the normal distribution. This is basically an approximation of the normal. Right, a normal distribution says there's 2.5% here about and 2.5% here. If something more fat tailed, it could be that there's more than two and a half percent of the observations, more than two standard deviations from the mean. And stock returns tend to be fat tailed and skewed. And so we would wanna know that, right? Um, here's our example with acid A again. So what's the probability of the uh, return being greater than 8.79. How much is in this area here? We would say, okay, it's 13.5 and 2.5. Yeah, 16%. What's the probability of earning less than 1%, well, 1.21%. This is the bottom, 16%. This is the bottom, 2.5%. This is the bottom, 50%. This is the top 50. This is the top 16. 
and this is the top 2.5%. So we can use this knowledge of the distribution to um, kind of gauge where the return will be, talk to our clients about how much risk they're willing to bear. Someone, you know, might not be willing to bear the risk of, oh, it's not bad, minus two to 12. Um, normally it would be much wider than that for a stock return. That one's not bad at all. Oops. But sometimes they care about the bottom something else. What, what else do we care about? So sometimes we care about the downside risk. Sometimes we care about the bottom what percent? bottom 5%, and we call that value at risk, but that's where the value at risk comes from. The value at risk is minus 1.645 standard deviations below the mean. So if I wanted to know what it was, I would say, okay, it's five minus 1.645, times 3.79, which would give us, got to be less than minus one. It's got to be more than minus 2.59 because it's somewhere in the middle. I get minus 1.23, although I could have done that wrong. 1.645 times. 3.79, yeah, no, I didn't write. So we could do a bottom 5%, we could do a bottom 10%, we could do a bottom 1%, right? Value at risk. The point here is what's risk? It's deviations from the mean. So we're thinking about the spread, right? If you look at um, historically common stocks, Average return, 11.7. Government bonds, 5.4. Treasury bills, 3.4. A 95% confidence interval. Where we think the returns will fall 95% of the time. For common stocks, it would be 11.7 plus or minus two times 19.9, two above and two below. For government bonds, 5.4, plus or minus two times eight. For treasury bills, 3.4, plus or minus two times 3.1. So that would help us at when, if we knew what the mean were, was and how to calculate standard deviation and understood what a normal distribution looks like. We could tell our client what we think the returns will be 95% of the time. If it were a 68% confidence interval, it's just plus or minus one standard deviation. Right? So understanding standard deviation is key. Again, we might also only care about downside risk, right? So we might care about shortfall risk, semi-variance, target semi-variance, downside deviation, and value at risk. All things that you will learn in the program. This, for, this is just the application of value at risk. Same as before, if I want uh, the bottom 5%, it is 1.645 standard deviations below the mean. 10%, 1.282, 1%, 2.326. So bottom 10%. Bottom 5%. bottom 1%, and then the standard deviation, 
2.33, 1.645, and 1.282. If we had more time, we would do it. But for now, this is just put it on the list of things you will learn, okay? So when we think about risk, we talked earlier how the more risk you take on, the more of an expected return you're gonna demand, right? With here, high risk, high return, emerging markets as well, low risk, low return, very close to the x-axis. So what risk is priced? The risk that's priced is non-diversifiable. Non non-systematic, well, systematic. Market risk, beta risk, these are all synonyms, okay? They're not different types of risk. These are synonyms. So what are these things, right? Um, and how is it priced? Well. Systematic risk can't be diversified away, therefore priced. You gotta pay me to take it on. If you're asking me to take on that spread, you need to pay me for it. Non-systematic risk can be diversified away, doesn't matter for price. What proportion of risk is systematic? Um, you could actually use something called R squared. <clears throat> you will learn this in class wherever you take your class. But I hope you come to Booth, it'll be fun. These are just some examples. So total risk is standard deviation. Diversifiable risk, new technology, union, uh, strike, major new competitor. Systematic risk, someone said it earlier, inflation, war, interest rates, business cycle changes. So if we were to look at this picture, if this is standard deviation and Y, and my x-axis is number of securities in a portfolio, as I add securities, I can get rid of my diversifiable risk. But I cannot get rid of my market risk. And that is our beta risk. So how much do we get paid, right? So you would need an asset pricing model. Um, so there's the capital asset pricing model. Simple questions. Why do some securities earn higher returns than others? They're riskier. When securities are riskier, you need to pay me a higher risk premium. How do we measure risk for individual securities? That's our beta. How much extra return should we require? the market risk premium. And in fact, we can put this into a nice model that you'll learn. And it says the expected return on any asset is the risk-free rate plus beta. This is the units of risk times the market risk premium. And then this together is our risk premium. By our, I mean asset I, whatever it is. Could be IBM, Apple, Tesla, I don't know, um, Virgin Galactic, anything, right? So we all learn where does beta come from? It's the covariance between our return and the market over the variance of the market. We'll learn how to calculate, where to get the data, how to do asset pricing, uh, use the CAPM to help us figure out over and under price stocks, use the CAPM for performance measurement. But the main measure that we care about today is risk. And that's beta and that's systematic risk. If you plot it, you could see like the higher your beta, there's the market, the higher your beta, the higher your expected return. Lower betas, lower expected return. 
zero betas, you're in the risk-free rate. And then finally, um, you know, you hear about a lot of different types of risks and we'll go through them all. Loss of principal, right? Losing the amount invested due to bankruptcy or default risk. Purchasing power. Unanticipated changes in inflation. Liquidity, funding liquidity, trading liquidity, geopolitical risk, currency risk, sovereign risk, interest rate risk, which incorporates price risk, and reinvestment risk, those two go in the opposite direction, credit risk, shortfall risk, and sequencing risk, right? I put in the back here, um, just kind of like different default rates for different types of bonds in case you're, in case you're interested. All right, I have to stop talking because I got to pass this on over to um, Monica, are you taking over or do you want me to do it? What do you want? I can take over. Huh? You I can, can take, take over. Right. Yes. Um, hello, everyone. So our program is a hybrid format. So it is the majority online. Um, and then at the end, we have the certification exam prep workshop, and you can attend, choose to attend live in here in Chicago or online. Um, our program is structured. So you are told or given what to study each week. There are quizzes, practice problems, and then the live sessions with Kathleen every Wednesday evening. Um, and then each week you'll unlock the next module. So you'll move through the course week by week. We do have some pre-work that you can access before the course starts. Um, you will be able to see your scores on the quizzes and ask questions during the weekly live sessions. And we also have a question and answer platform where you can ask questions throughout the week and get answers from Kathleen and her TA Paolo. Um, you're also part of a cohort in this program. So that means that you'll be able to join study groups, learn from your peers um, and have a sense of camaraderie and someone, <clears throat> excuse me, and some people to help keep you accountable as you study through the course. Um, we have a team of top Chicago Blue faculty, including Kathleen Fitzgerald, and numerous others who have some on-demand videos that you'll watch later in the course. So our next session will start January 3rd and run through April 3rd. Um, the course will kick off on January 3rd. So we recommend registering by at least Monday, December 4th. The Institute will take usually about a week to process applications. And then once you're approved, you'll be sent over to us where we will provide access to the course site. There are some pre-reading materials that I mentioned and some math basics, things that you can work through before the course starts to get you ready. Um, registration is done through the Institute's website. Um, so you'll complete a SEMA application through them. The application includes um, background check and your first attempt at the exam, as well as a membership through IWI. So the total is 5,999.5, which includes um, the Chicago Booth tuition and your application fee. And then as I mentioned, the IWI membership, background check, and your first attempt at the certification exam. So for more information, you can contact myself or Rebecca Meyer. Um, Carrie and Gray are also great resources if you have questions about the SEMA certification or which program to choose. Um, myself and Rebecca are happy to answer any questions that you have. Um, and you can find out more on our website and on the Institute's website. Mm -hmm. um, and this slide shows you a little bit about the materials that are included in the course. So we provide you with two ebooks, um, the question and answer platform. We'll have weekly practice problems, live online sessions, and you can watch the recordings of those over again. They'll also have quizzes each week. Moving on, weeks five through 12, we will also introduce live online on demand videos. Um, those are taught by our other professors, and they are in addition to Kathleen's weekly online session. Then at the end of the course, um, we will have the booth final, um, some practice exams and final quizzes. 
once you pass the booth final, you pass the booth class, then we let the Investments and Wealth Institute know and they will send you a choice um, for your vendor. You can choose to take the exam at a testing center through Pearson View, or you can choose to take the exam at home through ProctorU. Um, once you've made your exam selection, your testing window, your 90 day testing window will open and you'll be able to sit for the certification exam. And the sort of exam is five hours and it has 125 questions and 15 um, test questions. That's the certifi certification exam. Our exam is four hours and it has 100 questions. Yeah, I'm just answering a question in the chat for Robert. Okay, I'm going to take over now. So this is just a um, testimonial from one of our, our, our past participants. Monica and Rebecca can... Um, they, they know everything about this program they can just help you in every which way. Um, so I, I would definitely recommend talking to them. Um, I think it's a wonderful program that we have here at Booth. It's very, it's regimented, keeps you on track. If you stick with the program, you know, you'll be ready to take that certification exam four to five months from when started. Right. Um, and just to remind you, this is all of the material that you'll be learning today. We just did a very brief overview so you can kind of get a taste for it on risk measures, but we would be much more, we would move slowly and you don't have to worry about that. We don't want you to be scared. Uh, we move slowly and then as Monica pointed out, there is lots of support and lots of practice problems to help you. Yeah. There's no maximum or minimum number of students per session, so. We'll take everyone. Yeah, normally we have around 50 per session and it works out well. People get into study groups and they have a, they have a good time. Yeah, it's fun actually, yeah. Excellent. Uh, do, do you want us to take over our last few slides here, Kathleen? Are you ready? Just answering a question. Um, the other sessions are in the spring and in the fall. Yeah, I'm gonna let, um, I gotta, Give this back to Carrie. I just that I just got told. Yeah, hold on. Go ahead, Carrie. Great. Well, thanks, Kathleen. Thanks. And thanks for being so interactive and answering questions for everybody. Um, so I uh, just wanted to pick up here again. Uh, these are the steps to success, and these are what you do to apply. Uh, all the way down through the exam. We touched on each one of them, but uh, please apply through the investmentsandwealth.org website. Um, we can help you with that. Carrie and I can help. We'll provide our contact information to everybody uh, at the end of the presentation here. Um, the uh, $5,995 is due at the time of the application. Uh, second step is executive education. That's what we're talking about today, right? Chicago Booth, and the Yale University School of Management, two offerings today. Um, and then of course, step number three is the self-study when you begin the executive education. We recommend recommend around 150 to 250 hours. That ranges on your background, your uh, experience within the financial services industry. Um, and uh, that self-study goes on for Chicago Booth starting in January, January 3rd, all the way through March and then April when you take your exam which is the final step. And Kathleen touched on it a little bit, the five hour exam, uh, the number of questions, it's all multiple choice. Um, and uh, that can be taken at a Pearson testing center, or you can do it at home through proctoru.com, uh, through a proctor that will watch you and you set up a camera and all that. So that's, those are the steps to, to success and applying uh, here at the Investments and Wealth Institute. Um, so here's just sort of our final slide. Please take a snapshot of this contact information for me and Carrie. Uh, please reach out to us um, following the presentation. If you have any follow-up questions at all or having um, uh, issues enrolling uh, here at the Institute. Um, so I guess we can move it on to Q&A now. I know we answered a ton through the presentation. Um, I think, uh, let's see if we have any other further questions here. We have a ton. Q&A, great. So I think we got through most of the Q&A here. Yeah. Um, chats, uh, we'll have to catch up here, but um, uh, 
let me look here in terms of the Q and A. I yeah, the Q and A. One the certification exam is yeah. Pass it or you fail it. That's true, but right. <laughs> they don't give you <laughs> grades if you pass. They give you your grades if you fail. Yeah, that's right. We can elaborate a little bit more on the certification exam. We have uh, a candidate resource center which will discuss in terms of how the exam is graded. Um, it's a modified Angoff method, which uh, I can send people uh, through via email. It's uh, It goes into a description in terms of how the, the exam is graded. Um, okay, some of the other questions here. Uh, yes, we'll get you a copy of this presentation. Uh, Kathleen, we'll send it to everybody who needs it and we'll, We'll also be sending a recording of this uh, webinar as well to any to to the email address that you registered with. Um, and somebody had asked a question about the certification that you'll actually receive. You will receive two. Uh, you'll receive one paper certificate from either Chicago Booth or Yale University, and you'll all and once you complete the education portion, and then when you pass the exam you're fully certified as long as you have the three years of experience. Uh, you'll get a certificate from us as well, stating that you are fully certified for the, with the Certified Investment Management Analyst Certification from Investments and Wealth Institute. Uh, do you have to renew your certificate? You do have, um, you can get certificate, you can get those credit hours, but what, what's the requirement there, Gray? In terms of getting a uh, continuing education? Yeah, is there one? Yeah, so when you, uh, there are a couple of things. Uh, continuing education, uh, if you already have a CFP, for example, you'll get 28 hours for your CFP when you complete the education. But when you do, uh, when you complete the SEMA program, you'll get 40 hours of continuing ed internally here. So if you have a CPWA or an RMA already, you'll get certification for those designations. Uh, 40 hours with us. So I think we're kind of getting toward the end of the questions. I know we have a couple. Thanks, Marcus. Marcus gave us a shout out. Yeah, I wish you came here for the whole thing too. <laughs> <laughs> I know there's there are a couple of questions about tuition assistance and scholarship. Um, we can talk a little bit more about that offline, but we do offer tuition assistance here at the Investments and Wealth Institute. Uh, from our foundation. And we provide that in form of either grants or tuition assistance based on financial need, uh, diversity. Uh, there are a number of metrics on our website um, and uh, we can share that scholarship link. I can actually do that in the chat. Well, I think you've hit, hit them all, Greg. You hit them all, right? Yeah. Well, again, like I said, we're coming up to the end here. If you have any questions, reach out to us. And then if there are any more specific questions for Chicago Booth, we can, um, uh, I think uh, Kathleen and Monica and, and Rebecca have shared their contact info as well. So um, terrific. Well, thanks everybody for joining and we're looking forward to uh, talking to you soon. Thanks, Greg. Thanks, Carrie. Bye, everybody.